Well, good morning, Freedom Church. <clears throat> Somebody let the cat out of the bag. It's my birthday. I'm getting old. <clears throat> welcome. Come on, can we just welcome those from Rising Sun? Come on, Rising Sun. Love you guys. Middle River, <clears throat> Nairobi. And for those of you that are watching online, come on, from Bel Air, come on, right now, all of us, let's just welcome each other this morning. <clears throat> and I just want to say this morning that for those of you that are online, if you're staying at home because of your health, come on, stay healthy, all right? But if you're home because of habit, we're getting back to church, somebody. <laughs> we, are, we are getting back to church. And I just don't believe there's going to be anyone in the near future that walks over to the normal light switch and clicks it on. So as a church, we have to identify what is our normal. And I believe normal right now is about getting back to the Father's business, getting back to mission. Come on, are you with me, somebody? Amen. <clears throat> well, today we're in week three in the final week of our finals of this series from this day forward. And I know it's been a blessing, but today, I, I mean, I've had to talk to my wife about this sermon, so we're just going to lay it out here. I've got a few minutes. I've got to cover a lot of ground, and it's my birthday, so I want to go celebrate that, right? Um, but Lamentations 3 is kind of like the theme verse of this sermon today. And what we have is we've got Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah is the guy who wrote the book of Jeremiah, and then he wrote a book called Lamentations. It's an exciting book. It's going to really bring your love life up to speed. <laughs> Um, if you know, but he's lamenting, right? He's lamenting. It's a bad hair day for Jeremiah. It's, it's not a great day. He's depressed. He's thinking about his affliction. He's thinking about his wondering thoughts. He's thinking about his life choices. In other words, he's thinking about, hey, you know, I've gone places that I shouldn't have gone. I've been doing things that I shouldn't have done, and I'm kind of regretting that. And I don't want to put this into the context of relationships because we've all done that. We've all had our own book of lamentations, if you will. Okay. All of us have, have felt bad. All of us have felt shame. All of us have felt remorseful. Things we wish we would have done differently. Things we wish we wouldn't have done, right? Maybe we, gone, we went too far in a relationship. So it says this in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 19 through 23. It says, Jeremiah says, I remember my affliction and my wondering, the bitterness and the gall. It's really uplifting here. He says, I'm going to remember them. He said, and my soul is downcast within me. But this is where... This is where it switches, it flips. He says, yet this I call to mind, and therefore, come on, say this with me, I have hope. I have hope. Guys, we have hope today. I have hope because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And that's, that's exciting. But if we're not careful... We, we kind of lean in, or our default is, no matter what we do, you wonder from God. Even if you're not a Christian and you're here today because you got tricked into being in the building today, you're going to feel this from time to time. You're going to feel a wondering spirit. You're going to feel a remorseful heart, a heavy spirit, this downcast within me because of the choices we make. Yet, Jeremiah says, I call this to mind, therefore... I have hope. And if you don't hear anything else out of this crazy sermon today, I want you to hear this, that you can have hope today because we serve a from this day forward kind of God. Amen. A God who loves you regardless of what your past is. A God who loves you regardless of what you did last night. A, a God who loves you regardless of who you woke up beside this morning. A God who loves you in spite. Hello. A God who loves you. He wants to give us a fresh start today. And I just felt from the jump, you needed to hear that. You need to have a little bit of lamentations in your life. Amen. You don't have to wait till next year to have a great start. You can start today. God is willing to give you a from this Sunday morning kind of life. Which brings me to my next thought is, where, wherever God wants to work today and you allow him to work in your marriages, your relationship, your family, you need to start today. 
Go forward. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going forward. I saw some of your masks come down there in worship. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> Today's worship set was a, a nose-showing kind of day. You know what I'm saying? I know, Rising Sun, y'all been like rebels from the jump. <laughs> where, where was I? We'll wrap that up. We just have hope today. God can do anything. He's not too small. Your problems aren't too big. Amen. Because of the Lord's great love, we're not consumed. That just, that just had me up in arms this morning. All right. Let's dive in. I have a question. And I think it's a simple but great question. And that is this. Is a great marriage even possible? Let's just lean into that. Let's marinate in that for a second. Is a great marriage even possible? And I ask this question because a lot of people have become cynical about relationships. People kind of think, well, Pastor Wade, you can have a good marriage. You can have an okay. We have an okay marriage. But a great one? Nobody has a great one. Not even you. And the truth is, great marriages are possible, but they're not likely. And I just want to tell you, there's a newsflash, that the odds are stacked against you. Especially if you do what most Christians do, and that is follow the world's way. And I'm just here to tell you that this is becoming increasingly challenging because the world's way is increasingly vocal in what they think relationships should look like. And I want to tell you today that the world is perverted and truly sick, truly messed up, and you're going to end up as a stat if you follow the way of the world, right? And God has a better plan, and God has a better way. So you can have a great relationship, but you're going to have to follow God's way. Now, here's the good news. God is for you. God is for me. His way isn't sterile and boring. And I'm going to tell you that it works. God's way works. And it's actually fun when you lean into God's way. You're like, Pastor Wade, I, well, I'm not having fun in relationship. Because you're probably rebelling against God's way. Like if you feel like there's constant rules above your head. If you feel like there's constant tension. Like what you can't do. It's probably because you're being vortexed into the world's way. And you haven't surrendered into God's way. Is this okay, everybody? Can I talk about this today? Can I, can I preach about it? And I, I want to lay down just a few principles that I believe can be life-changing, right? And I, and I believe these principles can be, uh, it, it can create a life-giving culture in all of our relationships. In order for you to have fun, in order for you to be fulfilled, in order for relationships to work, for romance to work, there needs to be a bedrock foundation. There needs to be a solid foundation that's life. Everybody say life. That's life-giving. You need to have a culture that's life-giving. If the foundation of your relationship is not life-giving, everything is going to fall apart. And, and I believe, honestly, that that's what it's even attracted you to this church this morning is because when you're a part of something that's life-giving, you just want to be a part of it. You're like, I just can't put my finger on I'm serious. You're like, I don't even like church. Like, I don't even like it at all, but I just keep coming back. Like, I'm here again. Like, what am I supposed to do? Well, I believe it's this life-giving culture that keeps you coming back. Right? Mr. Salman, something just happened. And there is like a low ring that will keep my ADD floating in the sky. All right. But it's a breath of fresh air, a life-giving culture. Now, the word in the Bible uses this word spirit. Meaning, it just kind of adds wind to your sails. For some of us that are floating through life right now, the Holy Spirit can give us wind that's just, it continues to give life, right? So here's the theme verse. I love this verse in Deuteronomy 30. It says this, this day, this day God calls heaven and earth as a witness against you that right here in front of you, church, Freedom Church, is a choice. It's set in front of you. It's life or death. It's blessing or cursing. So in other words, this is not happenstance, 
Like some of them get them, some of them don't. No, you get to choose this. Today you get to walk out of here differently based on the choice that you make. And so the next words is this. It's, it's really clear. It says, now just choose life. Choose life. And this is where I want to encourage you that before we get into the practical side of marriage and the fun side of marriage, the practical side, the foundation, the bedrock is this. It needs to have a foundation of life. Right? You have to choose a life-giving environment for your relationship to thrive. Life-giving choices. Man, I'm telling you, by this choice alone, it impacts every bit of your relationships. And it says this, that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him, for the Lord is that, what? Source of life. The Lord is that breath of fresh air. He is that life-giving spirit, and you have to connect with him. So I want to give you three life-giving principles that I think are the bedrock, the foundation that all fun, that all healthy relationships should be built on. Here's the first one, and that is this. Write this down. You know that you get to heaven a whole lot faster if you take notes. All right, so here we go. Number one, like St. Peter's, like, I don't even have to think about it. Come on in. Like, you're you're, you're, you're in front of the line. Like, the big house up there, that's yours because you took notes. Pastor Wade's birthday. Number one, (laughs) life-giving relationships look to God as the source of their life. This is so important. I mean, that's what we do. In other words, I'm not going to put pressure on a person to make me happy. Are you ready for this? Too many of us are doing that. Well, Pastor Wade, I'm not happy. I mean, my wife. I'm I'm just not, I'm not thrilled. I'm not fulfilled because who I'm married to or my husband. So my question to you is, so they determine your happiness? They determine your joy. I mean, you have to be the reason why somebody's happy. Have you ever thought about you? Have you looked at yourself in the mirror lately? I've got to find my source of joy. I've got to find my source of happiness and love from God, not a person. And we are putting way too much pressure on a person for something that only God can actually do. Right? This is good preaching. Right? It's, it's true. And what I'm suggesting to you is to let God be the source of your love needs. Don't put all of that pressure on a person to make you happy or to fulfill you. Have you ever seen that phrase or on a cheesy Valentine card? Like, oh, you complete me. Oh, uh, if you think this is funny, you, you. Here's what I know. It's better, especially for you singles, for you to be complete before you meet that other person. And I would say, let that come from God. Be a whole person that goes into a, another whole person. And when God can get those whole people working, man, I'm telling you, you can be hopefully whole, right? Here's my second point. Life-giving relationships happen when two servants are in love. Two servants are in love. Write that down. Life-giving relationships happen when two servants are in love. So now that God is the one who has completed me, God is the one who fills me, God is my source of life. Remember the bedrock foundation that I'm going to choose life. God has now fulfilled me. Are you ready for this? Here we go. With that comes the miracle of Christianity. I now have this supernatural power to be a person that I could never have been before. And truthfully, you can't do any of this stuff unless you have God's power working on the inside of you. Like, P-Dub, how do I serve? Like, hold up. Shut the front door. How... (laughs) How do I serve another person? Here's how you do it. You fall in love with God and you do the first point. God becomes your source of life. Now you're able to be a servant to the other person, which by the way, you're going to have to be. Because great relationships have great worth ethics. 
great relationships say, you know what? I can't always look for you to meet my needs. I exist to serve you. And wouldn't you know it that God has a sense of humor and he puts you most of the time with someone that's completely opposite from you? Did you know, Freedom Church, that my wife is completely opposite from me? You're like, well, we come to church because of Sister Dawn. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, like, she's the glue that holds it all together. Have you ever done those personality profiles? I'm trying to preach, bro. I don't know what this roar is. Like, I don't know. I'm just I'm thinking of lions and things like that while I'm trying to preach. Have you ever seen the disc profile? You know, the personality profile? All right. There are four temperaments. You've got D-I-S-C, so they spell out the word disc. Well, I am D-I and Dawn is S-C. We spell the word disc. <laughs> we are opposite in every single way, which requires me to serve her. You know the five dumb love languages that came out with Dr. Gary Chapman? You know what I'm saying? They're not dumb. They're awesome, by the way. I mean, everybody has this different gift that they're speaking, this different language that they're speaking. Like, I mean, we are completely opposite. Dawn is acts of service. I am words of affirmation. She wants me to wash the dishes. All I need to hear is that I preach the house down this morning. And I usually get that affirmation if I wash the dishes. It's called chore play, if you know what I'm saying. Some of you are like, I shouldn't have come to church. This was a bad day to come to church. Thank you, God. I mean, we're going in different directions all the time. So what does this require? Only the power of God at work in my heart can give me the ability to serve Dawn in the way that she needs to be served. So when you have these principles, you get to number three. The third principle is that life-giving relationships make the choice every day. Life-giving relationships make the choice every day. Every day I make a choice. <clears throat> and I, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to dispel this myth today. Are you tracking with me? Are you with me? Are you leaning in? That, well, we were in love, but we fell out of love. Like, people talk about falling in love like love is a ditch. Like I fell in the ditch. It's like, yeah, it sums it up. <laughs> like I fell in love. Can I just tell you today that love is not a ditch? Love is not a feeling. What? Love is a choice. You have to make this choice every single day. Every day I have to make the choice that I'm going to let God fill my needs. Not a person. Not my wife. Every day I've got to make the choice that I'm going to serve people. I'm not going to serve myself. And then I've got to get over it and I've got to do this whole thing every day again. Every day. I make a choice. And I want to encourage you in this because I'm convinced that too many of us are thinking that this is just automatic. It's not. So let me help you. Can I help you this morning? Can I get practical about this? And for, and for us to get to the fun side of marriage, fun side in the relationship, I mean, you've got to get the practical. You've got to have a reality. You got to have a sense of being on planet Earth. You know what I'm saying? You got to have a sense of like being authentic and real and genuine. Like, wake up, somebody. You know what I'm saying? Have you met those people that are just glazed over? They're walking through life and they don't have a clue? I'm trying to help you today. I'm trying to help you today. Ecclesiastes. It says, love happily. And I just love this. It says, live and love happily. I love this because this is actually a huge spiritual revelation. Because I grew up thinking that God didn't want me to be happy. He just wanted me to be holy. All right? Ch track with me. He just wanted to sterilize me to boredom. Just get to heaven. Don't burn. Right? That, that's, you're like, that's the kind of idea. This was my view of God. I had no idea that he actually wanted me to be happy. Some of us just need to get happy today. How many want to be happy? Right? All throughout the Bible, God wants you to be filled with joy. Come on, Rising Sun, Middle River, Nairobi, online campus. He wants you to be filled with joy and happiness. God wants you to live happy. In fact, in the area of the physical and the sexual, which is what we're going to be talking about today, 
right? The only message that I heard from the church growing up was stop. <laughs> Don't. Dirty. No. And here's God saying, no, 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 guys, hold up. I want, you to leave, I want you to live happily with the woman you love through all the meaningless days of life. Holla at your boy. That God has given you under the sun. I know that life is immeasurable, but at least I get to have fun here. You know what I'm saying? I want you to enjoy your family, God is saying. The wife that God gives you is a reward. Hello. For all of your earthly toil. How awesome is that? All the men should say amen, brother. Like, I'm talking about go like old school church on that one. Like, praise God. You know what I'm saying? Look at the NLT version. It says, enjoy life with your wife whom you love, whom God has given you. Can we just celebrate that today? I mean, I had this thought, if, if we're beings that need this, and we have this desire to have fun and be happy, have joy and happiness, we're able to do that with the spouse that God has given us, right? How do we do that? Let me break this down real quickly, and I, I do have to hurry. God made us triune beings, all right? You have a body. We all see that we have a body, like some are bigger than others, right? You have a soul. You have a soul. That's your emotions. It's your will. It's your mind. And then he put a spirit. He, this is the only, only the, we're, us humans are the only ones in creation that he put a spirit in. He put a spirit inside of you, and that's, that's the part of you that's like him. It's the part of you that, whether you like it or not, will always be on a journey to find God. Always. I don't care if you consider yourself an atheist today. Every human being is on a spiritual journey because they have a spirit. We have a spirit. It's a part of us that's like God. And it will always be looking for something that's real and significant. And I believe that God has always intended, he's put a fun factor in all of us, to have fun in all three of these areas, body, soul, and spirit. So let's talk about the first one, emotionally. Long before you get to the sexual part of your relationship, or the physical part, your soul needs to be fed. It needs to have fun. There needs to be life in your soul. There needs to be life in your emotions. It needs to be built. Remember, it's the bedrock. And by the way, one of the primary ways that you can build someone emotionally and somehow some, you can destroy someone emotionally is through your words. Come on, everybody say words. Most people emotionally, their, their tank emotionally are either emptied or filled by words. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. I mean, think about this is what church is today. We sang words. Right now you're hearing words. We prayed words. And these words hopefully made it where you looked at life differently, maybe looked at God differently. It changes you. Words change you because we can be encouraged by words. This is what First Peter talks about in chapter 3 where it says, Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another, your family, your marriage. Be sympathetic. Love his brothers, be compassionate, be humble. Now watch this. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with another insult. And this is what a lot of our homes look like. We're not filling the emotional tank with positive reinforcement and life-giving words. But rather, we're destroying and we're building, we're taking down, we're ripping down by the things we say. So what do we do? We need to learn how in every situation to speak a blessing. To speak a blessing. How easy is it to point out the obvious? I can't believe you're doing this again. Let me tell you who you are. Let me remind you what you, you come on, you know what I'm talking about? But I wonder if we could flip that today and we go home and we speak blessing, right? Learn this beautiful principle of speaking things that are not as though they are. Are you tracking? You have an opportunity to be emotionally fun by being life-giving and speaking life. The scripture says this, that because to this you were called. This is your calling. This is not an option. Not to be an insulter, but rather to be a blesser. Right? Because here's the truth. 
When you do this, you become the beneficiary. You inherit the blessing, not them, but you. How many want to be blessed? This is for somebody here today. I just believe that. Right? So men and women, we have this gate that all intimacy flows through. The gate that most women have is the ear gate. Everybody say the ear gate. The ear gate. So men, you need to say things. That, that's why my wife just loves conversation. She loves the details. Oh my God. She wants to know the detail behind the detail. She wants to know the story behind the story. And if I do that, I'm telling you, it's a game changer. Y'all, I'm just saying. She wants to spend time together, but first of all, she wants to have a conversation. And every time I do this, it fills the tank, right? You Guys, you just can't come home and say, you know what, I've had a rough day. Let's get it on. That doesn't work. <laughs> We've got to feel each other emotionally. So let's talk about the second one. You're a soul being. Everyone say, I'm a soul being. You're also a body. And you can have fun physically. And there's an art to having physical intimacy in your relationship. And I hope you take in consideration everything we've said up to this point and how important it is to follow in building your foundation relationally on a life-giving foundation. Because God is for you, he's not against you. But I want to be very clear that God's way is the only way that works. And God's standard is not unclear in Scripture. I don't care what politically is happening right now. I don't care what society is saying right now. We're not driven by what society says. God's standard is one man, one woman in marriage. And that way works. And none of us have a propensity to do all relationships God's way. We all have to daily surrender our own lustful ideas, our own lustful thoughts, our way. And every one of us has them, and we have to surrender that on the altar of God and follow God's path and God's plan. And when you do this, I'm telling you, there's absolute joy in the relationship. It's hard to say it the right way, but I want to do the best that I can, is that society is trying to lead its best to lead the way sexually. And they follow a perverted way that has no true joy in it. There may be some temporary joy, but there's not lasting, sustaining joy. And I just believe that if we can come back to God's way, everything begins, begins to work right again. Amen. In Jesus' name. I'm telling you, you can trust me. You can take it to the bank. Bank of America, MB&T. God puts the pleasure in sexuality. He does. God puts the pleasure in it. I mean, he didn't see Adam and Eve over hiding behind a tree saying, oh, my God. Where is Adam putting that thing? You know what I'm saying? That's not what, that's not what God does. He puts the pleasure, I told you, in sexuality. Here's the reading of God's words. Pro Proverbs 5. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Proverbs. Proverbs 5, oh my God, I got to run, I got to hurry. It says, may your fountain be blessed. May your fountain be blessed. All throughout scripture, this refers to male anatomy as a fountain. Men, how many want your fountain to be blessed? There can be a blessing to your fountain today if you get this, these biblical principles. All right, may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. Come on, band, you, uh, go ahead, Rory, you got to come. And they're still like, I want my fountain blessed. Can I get my fountain blessed? Like, I'll sign up for the fountain blessing, Pastor Wade. Like, in several places in Scripture. Come on, can we all focus, please? I mean, come on, you, child, you children. In several places in Scripture, it talks about sexuality and relationships as a loving doe, a graceful deer. This deer analogy never gets old to me in Scripture. And it says, may her breast satisfy you always. This is the reading of God's word. God bless the word of God. May you be intoxicated with her love. Some of you that are guests, you're like, oh, my Lord. Like, in fact, if you really want to get spicy, go read Songs of Solomon chapter 4. It is a honeymoon. It is a honeymoon chapter. It will do you right. I promise you. But in so Songs of Solomon 4, the, the author is saying you're two breasts. He's very proud that there are two of them. Um, 
like two fawns, like, tw- see what I'm saying? Like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. Who's browsing among the lilies today? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but he talks about the deer. He keeps bringing up the deer. Because, man, you need to be careful about your, your approach. <laughs> I got to talk about that. You got to be careful about your approach. And this whole deer analogy fires me up because your pastor is the great white hunter. Like he, I love to hunt. Like I love to deer hunt. And I don't just barge through the, through the woods like this, you know, like, come on, wear the deer. Because if you do that, no, I work on my scent. I'm wearing camo. You don't even know that I'm there. I am like a myth. I slide in. I am, I am, I am, oh, I am like, dude, I cannot believe he got in the woods. Like the deer are like coming, licking my feet. You know what I'm saying? You got to work on your approach. You don't just barge in to the, the deer stand because they're going to run off. Man, come on. They're going to run off, man. Work on your scent, somebody. Some of you smell like you work the night shift. Dude, he's like rolled off the stage. Women, men have to work on their approach. Women, just have an approach. I don't care. Buy one. Read about one. Just bring an approach, right? Just make an approach. We don't care how. We just want one. And if you have the ear gate, women, we got to speak to you to get in. Guys, us guys have the eye gate. And if women are aroused by what they hear, men are aroused by what they see. And the only thing that I can say in this context without being inappropriate is think dress code. <laughs> Throw away your grandmother's flannels, please. <laughs> like those pajamas look like a walrus suit. I mean, they're five inches thick. Solar flares couldn't see through them. And I know you're warm and cozy, but it ain't working, somebody. Can I just, can I just say what everybody's thinking today? I mean... Rory, I'm serious. You got to come help me. Like, I have so much more content that I'm not sharing. So, man, we got to work on the approach. Think of deer hunting. Slip into the stand quietly and smelling good. And, I mean, you just don't bombard that. Just ease into it. And women, just, just make an approach. Just, just make an effort. And I, and I got a verse, one funny verse, and then I'll go serious. James 1.22, this is kind of how we wrap up. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. All right, so let's do this. And the last thing I want to say, Hebrews 3.1 says, Brothers and sisters, watch this. Your husband and wives, your holy partners in a heavenly calling. You want to take your relationship to a whole nother level, serve each other, and then serve together. God designed the two of you to make a difference on this planet. And one of the strongest bonds that Dawn and I share together is the ministry that we have together. It's a heavenly calling. And I, 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 I just had this verse on my heart that this is what I want to close. And I, let's all stand, everybody, at all of our campuses. And I know we've had a lot of fun. We've laughed and some of you have cursed me out in your mind. I hope that you didn't. I I pray that you receive this in the spirit that it's given. But Freedom Church, all of our campuses, Matthew 6, 21, this is what I want to close with. It says, and I've never thought of this verse as relational. But I think it can apply so well today. It says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. Where your treasure is, your heart's going to follow. So can I just ask you today, where is your treasure? Where is your treasure? Well, Pastor Wade, my treasure is in my time. My treasure is in my efforts. My treasure, it's my possessions. It's the stuff that's important to me. Right? People that I'm being put in the middle of. It's my things. It's my, it's the stuff that I love. And the Bible says, wherever you decide to put your treasure, 
that's where your heart's going to be. I had someone come up to me recently and said, Wade, I just feel like the love is gone. I feel like the love is not there. I feel like I'm not married to the person that I fell in love with anymore. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not feeling that love. I'm not feeling that passion. And it's the whole, the grass is greener on the other side of the fence scenario. And I would just say to that is if the grass is greener on the other side, well, maybe all you need to do, maybe this is your take away from today is maybe you just need to water the grass that you have. Amen. And it should make sense that the grass is greener over there is because that's where you spend the most time. Maybe in relationships right now, the grass is real green at work because that's where your effort is going. That's where your passion is going. Maybe the effort, the grass is real green in the gym because that's where you've been spending most of your time and that's where you've been giving most of your effort. I mean, you're giving the eight hours of your best day to your boss. So you're giving the best emotions, the best day to someone else. And everyone else is getting the best and you come home and your spouse gets what's left. Of course it's greener over there. Because wherever your treasure is, wherever you put the best of your life, this really matters because your heart follows. And I say this to anyone today who's in the give up stage. You're like, Pastor Wade, I just don't know, man. Here's my challenge as we close out this series. Put your heart in it. Put your soul in it. Put your emotions in it. And I'm going to leave you with this phrase that I, I, I mean, I could close out any sermon with this phrase. And I may do it going forward for the next several weeks. Choices lead, feelings follow. And you're like, no, it's the other way around. If I feel it, then I can make a choice. No, that's not true. You make a choice and your heart follows. And I just believe today there's some men that need to make some choices. There's some women that need to make some choices. We need to make some choices. So I just want to pray over us today. And we're going to turn this back over to our campuses after this prayer. But I just believe today that there needs to be some choices made. And we're going to, you know what I want to do? When we close at all of our campuses, I want there just to be a lingering. I just wish there would be some husbands that would take their wife by the hand and say, you know what? I'm just going to spend a few minutes in the presence of God with you today because this is what matters. I wonder if there's any real men of God today that, that just know that God's power and presence matters. Maybe you're single here today. Maybe this is what you want for your life. Or maybe you're the only spouse truly walking with the Lord. Come on, stay in his presence. It matters. So right now, God, I pray. I pray for all of our campuses. I pray for all of us right now. Maybe we're not batting a thousand. Maybe we're not doing it right, God. But right now, we are making the choice to make a change today. And it's going to be built on the foundation of a life-giving spirit that only you can give. So we praise you. We thank you, God. You do all things well. And we surrender our relationships. We surrender our marriages to you and to you alone right now. In Jesus' name. Can we give God some praise right now? Come on, everybody. Come on. Come on.